Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Psalm 103, verses 1 to 5. To bless God is an expression of praising thankfulness. It is an exclamation of our gratitude and adoration towards God's love, strength, richness, and glorious bounty. And to express our gratitude and adoration towards seeing and experiencing it, may you join us as we lift our voices this morning.
Psalm 37 verses 4 to 5 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in Him, and He will act. Greater love for the Lord means to delight in Him, delighting in His mind through the Bible and living the Christian way of life. May we continue to lift our voices in praise as our souls rejoice. His praises from a grateful heart Each time I think of you The praises start Love you so much Jesus, love you so much Lord, I love you, my soul sings In your presence, carried on your wings Love you so much Jesus, love you so much. This is my desire to honor you. Lord, with all my heart, I worship you.
thou lendest me breath, and say when the death do lie cold on my brow, if ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. of glory and endless delight I'll ever adore thee in heaven so bright I'll sing with a glittering crown on my
Good morning. What a great day to be with you, to rejoice in everything that God has done for us. And I am so thrilled to be able to be with you today and to share what we call Mother's Day. I want to share a greeting with all who are with us for the Bible message. May you find this message a wonderful truth that will sustain you in trying times. Being a mother is trying. Mrs. Hoagie and I fondly recall Mother's Day events at uh, Faith Baptist Church, South Metro. We miss those times, and so we dedicate this message to all of you. Every mother goes through a very tenuous experience in giving birth. One doctor I heard said, it's the time when a person is the most near death that can ever be imagined. There is such a strain on the body and even the pain and emotional experiences is death-threatening. I want you to keep that in mind when you greet your mother, if she's still alive today. Please write her a note. Let her know that you appreciate what she endured for your birth. But beyond the fact that there is an experience that we call birthing, in the physical sense, there is a spiritual side to this which we must consider. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, ye must be born again, which of course Nick did not understand. And so he asked if he had to enter into his mother's womb again and be born. This would be an absurdity, of course. And so Jesus explains in John 3, verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. While some would say this is far-fetched, Jesus said something so very important when he said this, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And so it's paramount that this be considered. Jesus is using the natural flesh birth to illustrate the spiritual. Later, he uses the wind to illustrate the work of the Holy Spirit. The flesh birth is first. It is natural and water is involved. When he said the water and the spirit by the water, he no way said or even implies that water is a baptismal fount, and so it's necessary for rebirth. Baptism, you see, takes place after the Bible tells us people are born again by the Spirit. Water here refers to the flesh birth. Without an adequate amount of amnioic fluid, the mother's at risk, as well as the baby. And this is one of the reasons for the popularity of the cesarean section. The doctor opens the mother to remove the baby. There's not enough fluids to ease the baby's uh, exit. And so I want to take just a little time to relate the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ, draw a parallel to the birth, the new birth, and life afterwards. Jesus was incarnate. He also had a ministry, and then he died and rose again. I want to see that the Holy Spirit, as we mentioned last week, is involved in all of these things. I believe that we will understand the way that the Holy Spirit works in our salvation, in our sanctification, and in our service. But before we begin to open God's Word, let's pray and ask the Lord to direct our thoughts today as we come to Him and are in need of His direction in our lives. 
Gracious Father, what a blessing it is to be able to open your word and to have your spirit open our hearts and our minds to receive these truths. Guide us, I pray. Help us that we will understand the wonderful, wonderful truths that are so life-affecting in these trying times. Remove any hindrance, I pray as we confess our sins, claiming that if we do this, you're faithful and just to forgive. And so we take a moment to do just that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, a subtext, if we can use a text, because I'm going to be going all over the Bible, uh, will be found in Philippians chapter 2, verses two through nine, uh, five through nine. Philippians two, Philippians two, verse five through nine. Let me read it, join along. Paul writes, and he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And this is true humanity. Verse 8, And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, in verse 9, God hath highly exalted him and given him a name, which is above every name. So, folks, during the period of the incarnation life of Christ, the humanity of Christ was sustained by the indwelling and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about that because the humanity of Christ had to be sustained by God, the Holy Spirit, just as we who have received Christ, been born again, and are members of the royal family would be sustained by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit during the Christian life experience. I want to point out several things. First, the picture of Christ's ministry. The process of salvation, you see, is similar to the incarnation. If we go to Luke 1, we will see some very interesting things. So I encourage you to go to Luke chapter 1. And here we see that the, the preparation that was made for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is so very, very important. In verse 28, the angel, it says, came in unto Mary. The angel arrived. The angel brought a message, and everything in the Word of God is required that the message be given. The angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. Again, this does not mean that Mary was without sin. She was favored, and in the Greek, this is kairito'o, meaning you are graced out. In fact, Mary, even in her prayer of praise, says that she rejoices in the Lord her Savior. She was not the fountain of grace, but as the Greek makes very clear, she's the one who received grace. Mary had received the gift, the grace gift, desired by every Jewish maiden since Isaiah's time, when he wrote in his book, in the Old Testament, chapter 7 and verse 14, these words. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us. It was the prophecy of the birth of the God-man, the Messiah, longed for by every young Jewish maiden. But when it came, you find in the following verses, it was perplexity 
fear comes upon her. And as fear comes upon her, she, she wonders what's going on in Luke 1 and verse 29. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. The arrival of the angel did not bring peace to her heart or even joy. But at this point, it brought her a troubled mind. There's a, there's a deep troubling of the heart before an awareness of the answer to the meaning behind everything comes to one who is given such strange news. Now, I've seen it time and time again. When the Spirit begins to work, there's a time of troubling. There's the promise, however, in the following verses, verses 30 through 33, that God brings to ease that troubled heart and mind. And here we read in Luke 1, verse 30, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God, and behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. You see, often we're not aware of how the Lord is working in the lives on whom he is doing his miraculous work. It's uh, done in secret as uh, the conception takes place in a secret place. But he's working by our testimony if we witness of the Lord in our lives and by the Word of God. We must never uh, uh, impose our experiences on others and think that if it's done that way in our heart, then he has to work that way in others. It's unique, it's separate, it's different. Well, after there's the, the announcement and the, and, the, and the questions and the answer, there are further, further questions. There's a troubling in the mind, and in verse 34, Luke 1, we find then Mary responds to the angel and says something. She says, I don't understand. How shall this be seeing I know not a man? Mary understood that for there to be a new baby, there needed to be a man's seed present. It's the reason that the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day didn't accept him, as they did not understand that prophetically the Messiah was born of a virgin, an earthly mother. They couldn't fathom the virgin birth. Humanity from his mother? Divinity from the Holy Spirit's work in her body, which is explained by what the angel answers and gives her an answer to the question. And there's always an answer to the questions that arise. He says in Luke 1 and verse 35, the angel, he says, come, it, uh, Luke writes, and says to her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore, also, that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. He's the Son of David. That's his earthly line. But he's also the Son of God. So, in summary, we're saved by the Holy Spirit coming upon us and the power of the highest overshadowing us. And because of the mixing of the Spirit with us, we in the new birth are conceived and born again at the fullness of his time of spiritual gestation. And this is different in every person, but God is at work to bring it to pass. The second thing I want you to see is the prophecy of Christ's ministry. His arrival was prophesied in Isaiah 7. The endurance of his ministry is declared by the prophets. Now, we're going to see this in the Old Testament in Isaiah 11 and 
uh, Isaiah 42 and 61. Notice, the prophecy of the sustaining ministry in the life of Jesus Christ was given over 700 years before he came. Here, Isaiah prophesies that when Messiah would come in chapter 11, verse 2 and 3, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. The Holy Spirit gave Jesus special intuitions, you might say, and abilities to perceive and comprehend, an intelligence of immense proportions, an emotion also, because he had a human side. The Holy Spirit would sustain and empower him. In Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4, let me quote that, Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. Behold my servant whom I uphold, mine elect in whom my soul delighteth, I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment or justice to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth. And this is referring to Jesus' death, justice in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. This was so that the Father's perfect will could and would be accomplished in his life. In Isaiah 61, we read these words in verse 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, and he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Now, all of these things did not happen at once. In fact, some of these things are yet to come. So we've seen all of these different areas of Christ's ministry, but notice the third thing, the period of his ministry. The Holy Spirit begins at the time of his incarnation. John 3 and verse 34. Not only does the Holy Spirit indwell the body of Christ, but he also fills his soul. And this is the total sustaining ministry to royalty. Jesus was Lord. In his humanity, he was born into royalty as the son of David, King David. In his spiritual royalty, this is different. His spiritual royalty is being totally sustained by the Holy Spirit. There was no spiritual royalty in the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit had no indwelling of the body of any Old Testament believer. He would come and he would go. Glorification of Christ by means of the ascension and, the ascen and his session in heaven instituted royalty for the spiritual battle that he left. That's why he said to the disciples, if I go away, I'll send a comforter. This caused the angel to say some things to Mary. It caused the age of Israel to be interrupted so that the royal family of God could be formed. Now, friend, this was accomplished by the means of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which was at the first time that the Spirit entered believers and brought them into union with Christ, permanent union. It began the indwelling of the believer by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the church-age believer is also royalty 
by being in union with Christ. We share his royalty as we are in him. We have the privilege of being indwelt by God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords is true royalty. Therefore his body was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. His soul was filled by the Holy Spirit. And this is why we as church a believers, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and yet we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because indwelling is permanent. He never will leave us or forsake us. But filling and controlling is different. The total ministry of the Holy Spirit to the incarnate Christ has been continued in the believer. So the power of Christ's ministry is here sustained. He is sustained by the Holy Spirit first at his virgin conception. That's what happens to us. The, the, the writer of, he, uh, of Matthew, in Matthew 1, 18 through 20, gives a different view than Luke. And he says in verse 18 of Matthew 1, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, or in this way, when his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. The psalmist in the 40th chapter, verse 6, says this, Sacrifice and offering thou didst not desire. Mine ears hast thou opened, burnt offering and the sin offering hast thou not required. Compare this with Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 5. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldst not, but a body hast thou prepared me. It was necessary that a body was required. It was absolutely vital. It was foretold in the Old Testament, and it was, for, it was accomplished in the body of Mary by the work of the Holy Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the source or the age, the agent, I'm sorry. It, he's the, the Holy Spirit is the source or the agent of conception. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, Mary would not have become pre uh, pregnant. The Father planned Christ's human body. It was all figured out and planned before the foundation of the world. So the Holy Spirit, as I said, is the agent that carries out the mechanics of the virgin birth. He provided the perfect chromosomes which fertilized the female ovum. The Holy Spirit is thus the agent also in the execution of what we call the hypostatic union, the coming together of perfect humanity and perfect deity, undiminished. He was not half man, half God. He was undiminished deity and pure humanity. So the Holy Spirit Sustaining Jesus Christ illustrates the Spirit's ministry to us, those who are born again. The Holy Spirit sustained the humanity of Jesus Christ at his birth, we've seen when we read Matthew 1, 18 through 21. 
The birth of Christ was as follows. After his mother was betrothed to jo Joseph before they came together, he was found of chi with child. While Joseph thought on these things, it says, or about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, don't be afraid to take her as your wife. She'll bring forth a son. You're going to call his name Jesus. What does Jesus mean? Jesus means Savior. And Joseph was commanded by the angel to name his son Savior. In verse 35 of Luke 1, the angel comes to Mary and says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Joseph was in the kingly line. The Holy Spirit was his father. Joseph did not provide his earthly chromosome. The Holy Spirit did. And Mary provided the other side. Now, the, the, the truth is, is this. We have to get this so clear. Jesus Christ was sustained by the Holy Spirit only in his humanity because he's co-equal with the Holy Spirit in his deity. As the God-man, he revealed every aspect of God's essence. Hebrews 1.3 First part says, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of God's person, referring back to verse 1 and 2. So we have sovereignty and righteousness, justice, love, eternal life, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence, truth, and unchangeableness, immutability. As a human, he relied on the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit, and he was led and guided by the Holy Spirit. In chapter 4 of Matthew, verse 1, it says this, Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Can you imagine? The Holy Spirit leading him into temptation but it was for a purpose not to destroy him, but to declare his ability over temptation. In Mark 1 and verse 12, it says it like this. Immediately the Holy Spirit drove him into the wilderness. Drove him. And he relied upon not his divine attributes in this way. He, div he had to accomplish his functions as a human being. He ate, he slept, he was tired. And he didn't ask for overcoming power in those things. I think sometimes we as Christians... We, we ask for something from God that he says, no, I'm not going to provide that to you. You're still a human being. In Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, Hebrews 2, verse 14 and 15, it says this, Insomuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, that's us, he, in Christ, himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. We don't have to be afraid. We have the Holy Spirit indwelling us, seeking to fill us and release us from fear. Philippians 2, verse 6 through 8 Christ Jesus, verse 6, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, 
but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming into the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. In the Greek, it says, he emptied himself. Jesus subordinated his deity to the will of the Father. He did not use the characteristics of his deity independent of the Father's will and plan. Therefore, Jesus Christ, during his incarnation, depended entirely upon the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit. Time and again, he separated himself. He went aside. He prayed, he communed with the Father through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He did not give up his divine essence. No, deity was always present. He's omnipresent. But he walked as a man and as a true humanity. He was indwelt by the Holy Spirit. The scripture gives no record of him ever being commanded or being filled with the Spirit uniquely. He was always filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given without measure to him. We read in John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he does not give the Spirit by measure. Total filling. The Holy Spirit was present in a special way at the baptism of Jesus Christ to guarantee that he would sustain Jesus Christ because in just a few hours, Jesus was in the wilderness being tempted. The Holy Spirit descending upon him as a dove, we're told. Matthew 3 and verse 16, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. The Holy Spirit empowered the humanity of Jesus Christ during his ministry. How? In several ways. In preaching and teaching. Remember, even as a young boy in the book of Luke, chapter 2, verse 46 and 47, it says this, and it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Jesus Christ was an amazing, amazing human being. He was also performing Miracles in the power of the Holy Spirit. Turn to Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, verse 14 and 15 and 18. It says this, Luke 4, 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Oh, interesting. Well, that's from Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 4. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. Remember, we read all of that. He was anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 18 and 28, we have an interesting insight. It says this, Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him. He will declare justice to the Gentiles. And Jesus says in verse 28, If I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. If. It's a first-class condition. If I do these things, then you should recognize that the kingdom of God is right here. 
And I do it claiming to be God. Jesus gave himself for crucifixion in the power of the Holy Spirit. We find in Hebrews 9 verse 14, it says this, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Let him cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Jesus performed his work under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But at a point in time, on the cross, something took place. What was it? It's foretold in Psalm 22, verse 1. Listen to the words of Psalm 22, 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Well, go to the New Testament account of Jesus on the cross. What do you hear? About the ninth hour, Matthew 27, 46. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice. The ninth hour was what time? Their day began at six in the morning. The ninth hour was three in the afternoon. Here's what he said. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. What does that word sabachthani mean? It means, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh, Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? The first my God refers to God the Father. God the Father forsook him. The second my God refers to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had a part in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was there and then not there when he was bearing our sins. They put his body in the tomb. The Spirit, we find in Romans 8, verse 11. Romans 8, 11 says, but if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, this is why it's so important that you have the new birth, the spiritual birth, so that he can dwell in you. That way you are assured of what? The resurrection. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says this, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but what? Quickened by the Spirit. We live in a flesh that is dying. And the answer and the solution to people's fear of death in these days of COVID fear panic is to accept Jesus Christ, receive the Spirit. Romans 1.4, he's declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So, the present ministry of the Holy Spirit to Jesus Christ is to glorify Jesus Christ. The Spirit given to us is not to glorify the Spirit. The Spirit of God that is given to us is so that he glorifies Jesus Christ. In our lives, Jesus Christ is glorified when we are first indwelt, by the new birth, and then filled. In John 16, verse 14, it says this, He shall glorify me, Jesus speaking, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. In John 7, verse 37 through 39, I read these words. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Now, John says in verse 39, to 
clarify, but this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified, presenting himself to the Father. That's his glorification. We glorify him when we are filled with the Spirit. So a believer in fellowship is set to glorify Jesus Christ. Glorifying Jesus Christ is a result of, of breathing and the filling of the Holy Spirit. It's like breathing. The manifestation of the new nature is as Christ Jesus set the pattern of the church age. We're born, we live, we die, we look for a resurrection, all because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Born spiritually, live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, we're told. The analogy between the life of Jesus Christ and the desired life of a believer in the age of grace is remarkable. We're called to be with the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. We're called to be doing the work of Christ. He sent us into the world. But he said, lo, I'm with you always. We are called to be acting with the Spirit of Christ, to be filled and to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Well, is it any wonder that we need the same Spirit that lived in Him also living and working and through us? I find it so sad that so often we as believers living in the devil's world we're not operating with the same supernatural power that he used. It's my prayer that we will desire that to honor Christ. All around we see how much we can do for God instead of letting the Holy Spirit of God simply work in us by filling our minds with his word and his spirit controlling us. It's time. It's time for believers to understand the work of the Holy Spirit and how he operates to direct, empower, and control every aspect of our lives. So today, let's be thankful for the way the Holy Spirit works so tenderly in, in the young virgin who, with the Holy Spirit, became the source of the humanity of our Lord. Let's also be thankful and appreciative of our earthly mothers who brought us into the world where we could experience what? The grace of God in our lives. And let's thank our earthly mothers who have brought us up perhaps in the love of the Lord, the love of his word. So I encourage you, take time while she's alive to thank her. Would you join with me as we bow in prayer? As I ask God to bless our mothers, my blessing is no good. God's blessing is everything. Gracious Father, how we rejoice in the spirit and the attitude of Mary and how her heart must have, must have, in one essence be saddened, but in another essence, another way, when she saw what her son, physical son, was going through, she realized it was the absolute fulfillment of why he was born. You call his name Jesus, the angel told her. May we today dedicate lives. May we dedicate our life. May we dedicate our service to you in a new and fresh way. Bless the mothers of Faith Baptist Church and those who listen today. May they understand that they 
also must be filled with the Holy Spirit so that they can produce the fruit, so that they can produce accomplishing the will of the Father. May we see the life of Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit be accomplished through our witness, through our testimony. How we thank you that in Christ we have an answer to the world that is full of fear because Mary not only got to see his birth, his life, Mary saw his death, but she saw his resurrection. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful truth. And may Jesus Christ be glorified in all that we say and do. It's in his name I pray. Amen. Now don't forget, there will be more teaching of the Word of God right here. In just a few moments, Brother Paul Camacho is going to come and teach us from the life of an Old Testament character. On Wednesday night at 6.30, Brother Matt Bautista is our teacher here at Faith Baptist Church Webcast. Thank you for tuning in today, and I'm praying that God will richly bless you. See you next time.